Greetings. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees for today's Fulbright Forum entitled The Primacy of Primary Materials. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for US alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 54 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbright, Fulbrighters, and alumni throughout the United States. Focused on international issues, the Fulbright Forums feature extraordinary speakers from around the world. Our speaker today, Don Fells, is an active researching artist in Europe, Asia, and the US. A painter, sculptor, and photographer, and writer, he began playing with art as a child and has never stopped. He's a three-time Fulbrighter to Italy, India, and most recently, Uzbekistan in 2019. Welcome, Don. Thank you. Okay, um, can you see me? You look good. <laughs> uh, well, I'm in Puglia, Italy. Puglia, for those of you who don't know, is at the very bottom, down in the boot. Uh, and it's the uh, la latter part of the day here, around five in the early evening, and it was a beautiful day today. So um, I'm going to talk for a, just a, a little bit, and then I'm going to show you some images and explain a little bit about what they are. And then I hope to get questions from you, because that always seems to be the most interesting part of one of these kinds of meetings. I'm, I just, this morning when I was thinking about what I was going to say, it came up with a term. I'm a, hy a hybridologist. I think there is no such thing, but uh, I just decided that's what I was, uh, meaning that I really have never worked in pure forms. Um, I've always considered myself as an adult and artist, but I have never really follow just one path and the paths I have followed have all been mixed together with other things. And I think you'll see that a bit uh, when, I, when I show you the images. What I'm doing now here in Puglia is working essentially with fresco, which didn't come to Italy until the 11th century, which sounds like a long time ago, but was relatively late in getting here. Um, and was, as I'm sure most of you know, applied directly to walls. I'm not applying plaster to walls. I'm applying it to wooden panels made of poplar. Uh, and that, using panels and painting on them, is what is called in Italy panel painting, and which came a couple hundred years later in the 13th century, or as it's called in Italy, the Trecento. So what I've done is sort of combine two forms. I'm, I'm painting on wooden panels, but with plaster, which is really fresco. And the reason for that is because as the title suggests, I'm very interested in primary materials. And here in Puglia, all the towns, the ancient towns are made entirely of limestone. That is everything, sidewalks, streets, outside walls, inside walls, the house I'm speaking to you from now is completely made of limestone. Lime, which is the basis of plaster, is simply limestone that's ground and cooked and aged, actually like a good cheese for four years. So it's the material of here. And when we started spending time here, and when I got a studio, I thought, well, I, I should really be exploring what this place is all about. And so that's how I got into doing stuff with fresco. Um, I've been interested in primary materials for decades and have chased them all around the world. And that's what all my research has been about, including the three Fulbrights I've had. Um, I'm, I'm interested because materials bring together people, place, and the stuff the, the planet is made of. And so that's been a very, uh, good way for me to get involved with what a place is about. For a long time, I tried to keep 
what they call my artistic practice in separate categories. So I did public art, um, I worked in the studio and I wrote. And I tried to keep big walls between them. And as I got older, I decided that was rather ridiculous. So now it's all mixed up. And um, what I do here in Puglia is I work in my studio, which isn't far, far away from where I'm talking to you from. We don't have a car. I walk everywhere, which is great. Um, I have a small studio here and I go there every morning until pranzo time, which is lunch. And that's the big meal of the day here. So it's a bit later. And then after lunch, I take a siesta, which I have done for years, um, which allows me to, to put two days into one. And once I wake up again with an espresso, I spend the afternoon writing. And last year, I wrote a series of dispatches because we were stuck here during COVID for a year and a half. We were supposed to be here for four months and that's what happened. Um, so each week I sent out a dispatch and people seem to like them. And so I'm working on with an editor to turn it into a book. So I'm spending this year uh, here in the afternoons going over the chapters I've already written, editing them. Um, <laughs> then I wrote down here in my notes and I think about stuff when I should be sleeping too. So at nighttime, my brain seems to keep going. I'm an early riser. I wake up early. Um, the last couple decades, my particular interest in primary materials have revolved around color. And that's because I seem to have been born with some kind of innate ability with color. I don't know where really it came from. Um, it took me a while to understand that that was something that was inside of me. But I have this ability to see colors and replicate them um, pretty, pretty well. And so I've been interested in, in color as, as a natural material, as a commodity. Color, of course, is something that exists in the world. A flower has color, the sky has color, but it's also uh, a history of pigments and people's choice of what they've used for colors. And uh, as I'm sure some of you know, some of the pigments that are use the most have Italian names attached to them because they used to be mined, dug up in particular places. I was just last week in Siena and um, there's a color still this day called raw Siena. And in Siena, not strangely enough, the walls are plastered with raw Siena. That's because it, it comes from the dirt right there. Okay, um, I call myself a researching artist. And each of my Fulbright fellowships has been to conduct research. So we're gonna look at some images now. Um, I will have the first one up. And, okay, so this was the poster I did. Um, in 1985, I had my first Fulbright to Italy. I had no idea why I got this Fulbright, um, none whatsoever. I was not uh, uh, a student, but as an artist, that's the Fulbright they gave me. Uh, and you know, I was incredibly grateful for it. Uh, I decided I wanted to do some research into wall posters. I had, I had been in Italy before and seen that wall posters were everywhere in the, in the centers of cities. And I was curious if, if anybody actually looked at them. So it just happens that my last name, Fels, is the Etruscan name for Bologna was Felzina. So I just printed these posters up that said Fels Felzina, Bologna 1985, as if they were exhibition posters. But you can see from the information that was on them, there was no there was no information about an exhibit. And I, and I had them put up in the center of the city. Next slide, please. Munir? Ah, okay. So they would put them up in groups of four and I would get a, a list of where the posters were put. And I had a bicycle that I retrofitted with some paints and collage material. And I would go around and change one or two of each of the collages. I gave no explanation for this. I just did it. And as I said, it was, it was a research project. It was an experiment to see if anybody noticed. I would go, I did this in the morning. I would go back in the afternoon to photograph them and not very long into the project, I noticed that a lot of the ones that I had changed 
altered, like the one on the bottom right of this photograph, were gone. And I soon realized that people were collecting these. I never saw anybody collect them. They just had vanished. And not too many months into the project, even though nowhere on the poster did it explain who I was or what I was doing. Uh, next slide. Um, this is another poster I had printed. And this one actually came about later because you can see it says that, um, that I was to have a show at the museum. Next slide. And that's because I had been putting up these posters and fooling around with them. And the museum traced me and found out who I was. And there was no official notice of this anywhere, but they found me and offered me an exhibition. Um, so that was a very cool uh, outcome to this project. And the answer was yes, uh, people did notice them. Years later, five years ago, I was contacted by the same museum who, was, who were doing a, an exhibition about street art in Bologna. And they said I was the first person to have done street art. And the guy who was curing it, curating it had been one of the people who had cut the posters off the walls. He had them. So, so that was very cool. OK, next, next slide. OK, now we're in India in 2005. And um, I was very interested in the story of Vasco da Gama coming to Kerala, which he did in 1498. And some of you, I'm sure, know the story. It's not actually a happy one. Uh, da Gama created the direct link from Europe to India for the first time, and also brought along colonialism in its wake. And at the time that he showed up from Portugal, Portugal was the poorest country in Europe, and India was one of the wealthiest countries in the world, wealthy in every sense, culturally, in terms of money, um, in terms of history. And, the colonialism that followed in da Gama's wake pretty much got rid of all that. Um, India is still recovering. So this was um, a, a piece I did. I, we did 16 large panel pieces. I say we, I worked with a group of ex billboard painter. That's a painters, it's a long story, but when I proposed the project, they were still painting live in the street, up in the air, big billboards. By the time I got to India to do the project, that was all finished. They were using printed billboards. But I found some painters. And you can see this is made up of panels. And each one of these panels is four foot by four foot. So this one is 12 foot wide by eight foot high. And um, it has an interesting side on the corner you can see where the facial hair is the painter said to me that white people had a sort of ghoulish cast that's why it has sort of green flesh around the mouth and i was really very pleased that these painters that i was working with had an opinion these guys there were five of them sometimes six all had come from what are called low caste backgrounds and these were the people that Vasco da Gama had mistreated the most. So 500 years had passed, but they had heard that he was a bad guy. And I thought that was really interesting. I was interested how history would come down to basically not very well-educated people, but they were educated in the truth. Okay, next slide. So you can see on the right side of this, um, there's a pirate ship, and the pirate ship was actually taken from a, a painting of what uh, da Gama's boat was supposed to have looked at like, and one of the painters told me he had heard he was a pirate. In Portugal, which is still a left-leaning country, he's considered still a hero, but he was indeed a pirate. And this particular piece is about some natural medicines that have been known in India for centuries, which researchers in the United States tried to patent. So that's why it says US patent number and they are uh, neem and, and turmeric um, are the two you can see down on the bottom. And they were 
trying to be patented so that if they were used in medicine, medicinal companies based in pharma companies based in the United States would get paid, even though traditionally they've been used for centuries. So uh, I asked if that was local knowledge or global information or piracy. So we did a series of these 16 uh, panels. Um, the Fulbright Association of India, which is the world's largest, decided to use one of them on their uh, annual report. And the show of these panel paintings went to eight museums, traveled around to eight different museums. Okay, next slide. All right, now we are more recently in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. And um, I went there officially to research color dyers who had been brought by Timur, um, who was the ruler of Uzbekistan after Genghis Khan destroyed its fabled cities. And Timur wanted to rebuild those cities in the silk trade. So he brought dyers from Egypt and Iran. And I was interested in the history of those dyers. I was supposed to be using a teaching about research at the university and the students I was working with were supposed to be helping me do the research. Interestingly, vis-a-vis -vis what's going on right now in Uzbekistan, in, in Ukraine, Joseph Stalin died in 1953. Uzbekistan was unleashed from the Soviet Union in 1991. These students were certainly not alive in 1991. And yet they told me they couldn't do research. And I said, why is that? I was brought by your university to do research with you. Well, you can't ask too many questions. So talk about his, historic memory. These kids whose grandparents were, were sent away by Stalin if they asked questions were still afraid 40 years later, excuse me, 50 years later to ask questions. So they essentially refused to do research with me. Next slide. So I made some collages in my own time. And then I, through a series of coincidences, ended up going into the steppe to Nukus. And some of you may have heard of it. It's a small little place in the middle of the steppe. There's nothing there except a big museum, which is called the Savitsky Museum. And Igor Savitsky, during the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, took trips, took him three days on the train to get to Moscow. He was born in Russia. And he collected art, next slide, that was done by artists under Stalin who were forbidden to do anything except propaganda, prop, social realist art. So these works were hidden away by the artists. And then if the artist was still alive, which was very rare, usually they were killed or sent to Siberia, their families had inherited this work. And Savitsky purchased or borrowed this work for the museum. I was interested in the graphic work. This is an example of it. This particular one I chose to show you, many of the works were two-sided because these artists had no money for materials and they suspected no one was ever gonna see this work anyway. So you can see the writing on here. This is the retro side, the verso side of a piece that Igor Savitsky himself thought was of less interest than the piece on the other side. When I, I spent six weeks buried in the archives of this building, looking at work that hadn't been looked at since Savitsky himself had touched it. None of the work ever was exhibited in the lifetimes of the artists and almost none of it has been exhibited since. Um, I spent this time trying to photograph the work. There is very little photographic record of it. And my hope was to build a touring exhibition in the United States of these works, which I found to be incredibly important. This was dissent that was never heard. These artists never got to show what they were doing. It seemed to me this needs to be looked at by the world, but during COVID that became impossible. So it's still a dream of mine, but that's the research I ended up doing in 
Uzbekistan. Okay, next slide. All right, now we are here. Um, and the next few slides I'm gonna show you are of the work I began talking about. Um, this is plaster on poplar panels. Poplar was the same wood used for panel paintings in the 1300s in Italy, except that I'm using very thin poplar plywood, which strangely enough is more stable than the poplar wood that was used in thicker planks because plywood is made such that <clears throat> the ply runs in three different directions laminated together, which makes the plywood very stable. It also, poplar is very lightweight and um, doesn't warp with moisture. So it's a perfect wood to use. Uh, as you can see, I'm once again working in a modular fashion as I did in um, India, but these are, these are smaller. The uh, square there is 44 centimeters by 44 centimeters. So it gives you a, a scale to look at, but this is simply pl pigmented plaster on wood. Next one, here's another. Um, I'm simply playing with color. That's all I'm doing here. There's no form involved. Um, I'm interested in just seeing what happens when I put colors together. Um, it's a, a very personal kind of research, but I found it to be extremely satisfying. Next one. And I'm working with modular uh, panels that are variations of the same sizes, which allows me sort of infinite possibility of combining and recombining them. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of puzzle making. I make the puzzle and then try to solve it, which I think is what most artists do most of the time. Next one. They're really meditations um, of time passing, of colors bouncing into each other. Next one. These are, let's see, this one is probably about, I'm, I'm in inches, I don't measure them in inches because I'm here working in centimeters, but it's about four feet wide by uh, probably about two and a half feet tall. Um, and, and I think there may be one more. Yeah, so that's the, the last of these panels. Um, as I said, they're not painted. Um, I'm applying the, pig the pigment is mixed into the plaster. I put many levels, very, very thin of plaster on the panels. You can see the, the piece on the left of this, the sort of gray color, you can see the red underneath that from the, the layer beneath it. There's also yellow beneath that, green beneath that, and white beneath that. Now you don't, as a viewer, see all these directly, but indirectly they change the color. And that's what I'm interested in. Um, so it's a slow process of building up very thin layers of plaster. And um, as I said, one that I find um, personally very interesting. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, I work in ceramics as well. And then around the world, I do public projects. I'm working on one right now uh, for this taking place in Florence, in Firenze, Italy, um, which I will work on uh, when I return to the United States in a short time. And then I'll be coming back here again in the fall. Um, I, I wrote something down here. Research in the materials is about the confluence of ideas, place, people and culture, how they come together. Making art is about extracting in the other direction, taking what you discover and making something of it. Um, I think in, in, in conclusion, I'd like to just say that I think artists make really excellent Fulbrighters. Um, I would encourage anyone who knows an artist who would like to apply to help them through the process. And if you're an artist and seeing this, um, please go ahead and do it. I know that a lot of artists believe that Fulbrights are only for academics. Um, that is not true. I, I did teach at the university at the end of my teaching career, but 
I'm not an academic, I'm a working artist. I wasn't an academic when I got the Fulbrights. And I think the reason artists are so good as Fulbrighters is that we're naturally curious and because we can wing it. Um, as I mentioned, in each of my Fulbrights, um, what I proposed to do didn't exactly work. When I went to do the wall, uh, wall posters in Italy, they told me I, it was illegal to mess with wall posters. And I had to get someone to explain to the bureaucracy that I was messing with my own posters before they would let me do it. In India, the billboard painters I hoped to work with didn't exist any longer. I had to go find them. And in Uzbekistan, the research assistants that I was supposed to have didn't want to do research. Um, that's the way it works when you propose a project in a place you've never been or that you that is not your home, things happen. And I think artists are really good at figuring out what to do about that. That's what we do. So, um, okay, that's what I wanted to say. Um, I'd like to answer questions if you have them. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Don. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, John, I'm not sure if you wanted to, you want me to read it or would you like to mute and ask your questions? I can, uh, I can uh, ask them myself. Don, thank you so much for, for doing this. A fascinating, uh, really inspiring uh, talk. Uh, beautiful pieces work and so different from each other, which is really, <laughs> really great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my question, and I have a bunch, but I'll, I'll be in the rotation. Um, the, f the first is uh, what your those panels relationships are to Mark Rothko's work. Ah. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I was thinking as I was watching looking those panels, I'm thinking I've, I've seen something like this before. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, Rothko comes to mind, but you're there are so many different inspirations for you. I'm wondering if he's among them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Rothko was uh, somebody who I looked at a lot when I was much younger. Then I had to try to banish him from my brain because you know <laughs> you, you don't want to be a copycat. But when you get when you get to be old, you stop worrying about what you should do and just do what you want to do. Um, I think one of the things that I've concluded, and and this could be completely wrong, and unfortunately, Mr. Rothko isn't alive to ask. But um, I believe he looked at plaster walls for some of his inspiration and then abstracted from there. I'm going back to the plaster walls themselves. And so uh, I think there's a, a slight difference. We also have a different palette, but for sure, um, he was dealing just with pure color and that's what I'm doing. Um, and they are in quadratic form. So for sure, there is, there is some connection. Another question? Alicia? Question. Oh wait, is someone? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, you talked about um, how the, the three P's, the people, place, and the planet, which I thought was easy to remember and made a lot of sense. So thanks for that. Um, I'm interested in knowing what drives your inspiration. Like your um, Fulbrights were in three very different countries. Like what, or is it the materials that drives you to, to go to the, like, the place? Or is it the place that drives you to explore the materials? Like what's the, um, the kernel of inspiration there? Well, it's sort of both. Um, if you promise not to tell anybody, I'll tell you a secret, which is that um, in a couple cases, I just wanted to go there. And once I wanted to go there, I had to come up with a project. So India, for example, I was really curious about what this amazingly huge, important place must be like. And I thought, well, I want to do research, but on what? So uh, for some reason, which I don't remember any longer, um, my wife and I were interested in going to Kerala. So I started using my research skills to find out its history. And when I discovered that Vasco da Gama had come there, I thought, okay, I knew a little bit about the story of Vasco da Gama and colonialism and world trade. And I just dove into it because I thought, 
he this guy this guy pushed a button that has never con, become unpushed and he's really important but that was 500 years ago what do people think about him now so that's how i got into doing that particular in terms of uzbekistan i read a footnote in some research i was doing about these iranian color dyers who came to Uzbekistan 500 years ago. And I was fascinated by how that happened. So when I saw that you could actually apply to Uzbekistan, which I knew zero about, we had never been to Central Asia and that seemed a perfectly valid reason to go, um, I applied and they said, oh, we're not interested in having artists. And I said, oh, I, I, I'm not doing any art. I'm just coming to do research. And uh, so I came as a researcher and I researched what, what, what I wanted to research. So, so it's a mix, I guess. Pamela, she um, has a question for you in the chat. Um, she asked, how did you choose, how did you choose your locations? Well, I, I sort of answered a little of that just now. I answered it by places I wanted to go. Um, I did, I have to admit to you that I didn't know when I applied foolishly at, at age 35 for my first Fulbright that Italy was for artists the most popular place to apply. I had no idea. Um, if I had known it, I probably never would have applied because I didn't think I would ever get it. Um, but uh, I, I had been, when I was 19, I'd saved up money from two summers worth of work and I hitchhiked around Europe and Italy had been the place that I had found most fascinating as, as somebody who loved art. It, I, I mean, how could you not find it fascinating? So um, I thought, whoa, I'd like to go there. And uh, so I applied, as I said, if I had known how many applicants they get, I never would have done it, but luckily I did. And um, one other note, which I mentioned to John, when I met the, woman who ran the Fulbright program in Rome, she told me she couldn't believe that I'd gotten the Fulbright to do what I proposed to do, which was basically work in the street. She said, we've never, we've never funded anything like this. So when I got asked by Bologna's Contemporary Art Museum to have an exhibition, she wrote me and said, I take back everything I said. That's great. So, you know, you just never know. Um, but I think generally, for Fulbrighters, you need to go someplace that fascinates you, for which you have a passion for, because passion's what drives the whole program, I think, at least for me. Uh... Don, we have another question. Um, did COVID affect the type of art that you did most recently? Yes. Good question. Um, so I mentioned, so what happened to my wife and me is in October of 2020, my Fulbright was up in Uzbekistan and we decided to come to Puglia where we had this tiny little house and I had this small little studio for three or four months. And there's a, there was a direct flight from Tashkent where we were, the capital of Uzbekistan, to Rome. Not a long flight, we thought, perfect. We booked the flight. We didn't know that when we landed, they canceled the flight from then on. COVID had arrived in Italy at that point. And as you might remember, after China, Italy was the first place to be hit with COVID. At that point, the only places in the world that knew they had COVID were China and Italy. Of course, it was already all over the world, but people didn't know that. So we ended up getting stuck here. We stayed in Puglia for a year and a half. We couldn't get home. And um, I have to admit, it wasn't torturous. Um, I, we had a house to live in. Uh, we live a very isolated life here anyway, so we stayed healthy. And I went to work in my studio every day. And I had been working in plaster on board before, but I had been fooling around with forms. And John asked the question about Rothko. I think feeling like I could die tomorrow, I decided to just immerse myself in color. I thought, you know, Life is short. I don't have time, maybe. Maybe all I have is the chance to play with color. So I'm going to do that. So that's what I did. I just, every day, 
just put color on boards and reveled in it. And I found it enormously, enormously meaningful to me. It just happened when I took the work home to Seattle where I'm based um, this last summer, people really, really liked it. I didn't do it for anybody else. I liked it for myself and that was why I did it. So yes, COVID did change what I did. It also had me writing these dispatches which I sent out weekly. And then people said to me, oh, you should make a book. And now I have an editor. And so I'm doing that. So in two distinct ways, it changed my life. It got me just playing with color and it got me writing every week. So uh, or every day, really. So yes, um, it did. And for that, I'm grateful. I'm not grateful for COVID, but I'm very grateful that um, it forced me into a corner with myself. Yeah, and I think I, I think the chance of me getting a fourth Fulbright is pretty nil. <laughs> I didn't think you could even get three. Um, but I feel badly. We've spent a lot of time in Asia and in Europe, um, in Central America. I haven't been as much in South America, but I feel I've really missed the boat by not spending time in Africa. And um, I don't know, I'm 75, I don't know if I'm gonna have a chance still to do that. I would like to believe I can, because like India, it has an incredibly rich culture and uh, one that like India has been deeply affected by colonialism. Um, it also is a place, as we all know, that has been colonialized and beat up because of its richness of natural materials. So, it's a place that logically enough, I should be doing research in. Um, I just haven't gotten there. Um, I have friends from Africa, uh, but I haven't gotten there. So, and, and that's, that's, that's a big place. You asked the place, Africa is a large place, but uh, yeah, I would still like to do that. Pam, you could go ahead. Yes, thank you. I have a broken arm, so it's harder for me to type right now. But I had two questions. Um, one, Don, was I, I wondered, you know, since you've talked about, you know, sort of the inspiration on color when you go back to Puglia, whether you plan to continue in that same kind of vein or whether, you know, when you return, you might do something different. So that was one question. And then the other was, I, you know, I know how um, Fulbrights are so well known and entrenched, as you said, in academia and at universities. And I was just curious as an artist for the very first Fulbright, what your path was, um, you know, to learn about the Fulbright program and all of that kind of thing. Two good questions. Um, yeah, I think I'll keep painting what I'm doing um, when I come back to Puglia, which we seem to do now regularly because it's really pleasing to me. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that it won't change because you know, why, you know, why not? Um, that the path that I took to my first Fulbright was talking to a beautiful woman at a dinner party. I was seated next to a woman who I didn't know. And, um, we were talking about, I don't know what I can't remember. And she said to me, you know what? You should really apply for a Fulbright. I said, me? I'm not an academic. Why, what, uh, what are you talking about? And she said, oh no, you don't understand anything. Artists can apply for Fulbrights. I don't know how she knew this. She wasn't a Fulbrighter, um, but she kind of dared me. And so I left the party thinking, well, I got to look into this. And uh, I mean, when a beautiful woman tells you something um, and points right at you, you, you need to pay attention. And so I did. And so then I found out that I could in fact apply. I had to apply as a student to Italy, which as I said, I was 35. I certainly wasn't a student, but that was okay. They would allow artists to apply, but that essentially was a, a, a question of money. Student Fulbrights were the least amount of money. And if you were willing to take the least amount of money and you got it, you could go. So I applied. I didn't get it the first time. And one of the things I disagree about Fulbright, and I don't disagree with much about them, but they give you no feedback. So I had no way to know why I didn't get it the first time. Um, I had to second guess it. Um, 
But I went through the whole process. I talked to some people and they told me, yep, it's very common that people apply two or three times before they get it. So um, I applied a second time and who knows why I got it the second time. So um, that was my path. It wasn't, I, I, I did have the advantage of, I went up because I lived in Seattle or near it. I went to the University of Washington to, they had an office of grants, I believe it's called, something like that. And they were very kind um, in giving me feedback about my application. So they, even though I wasn't at the university, um, they, they helped me. And so they made my path a little straighter, um, but yeah, that was how I got there. Luck, good luck, I think. <laughs> Okay, um, thanks for sharing that, Don. We have another question that came through the chat. Um, have you had a chance to see the ancient monk made fresco cave in, Pug in Pug Pug Puglia? No, but I have seen ancient monk fresco caves in India, which are quite extraordinary. Um, I've read about the ones in Puglia. Um, I have not yet seen them. Um, and that is correct. Frescoes go back a very long time. Well, you, you all know that the earliest art we know anything about is people painting on walls and they weren't using plaster to do it, but they were painting right on walls. So um, no, I'll try to see how I can go see those. But the ones in India are extraordinary and um, we, we were fortunate to do that. Don, do you have uh, advice for a, a junior in college who's an artist who is thinking about doing a Fulbright or translating their art into a research project that could be used as an application? Well, the first advice I have is go for it. And don't let people tell you that you have no business applying. Um, as I said, I think artists make very natural uh, Fulbrighters. That said, you have to read a little between the lines. A lot of countries don't list art as one of the subjects that they're interested in having Fulbrighters from. A developing country might want agronomists or economists or biologists or physicists. Um, they probably don't feel that they have the space for an artist. However, that doesn't mean that you can't apply. It simply means you have to find a way of putting your research to writing it up so that you are really doing research. And you can still be an artist there, but you can't say, I'm going, I want to come to Bolivia. I'm making this up. I don't know anything about Bolivia's requirements, but to paint pictures. But you could say, I'm interested in researching the biodiversity of the jungle in Bolivia. And you don't have to say, and I'm hoping that those that research will end up in a series of paintings. Um, I'm not saying you need to lie, but I am saying you need to meet the requirements of the host country. If they want researchers in a field and you feel you can do that research, let them know that. In each case that I applied, I told them I was a working artist, but I also told them I was a researcher, which is true, I am. And I've taught research around the world including in universities in America. So I, I pointed that out. Um, but I think it's really important for someone in university, an artist who would like to do a Fulbright to apply. You cannot be chosen if you do not apply. Many people have come to me over the years and asked for help. When I tell them what's involved, most of them don't apply. They think it's too onerous of a process. The few that have applied have all gotten it. But most people look at the application and say, whoa, that's too much. I can't do that. Sure you can. You just need to leave yourself plenty of time. And in my case, what I did each time is I gave myself much time to make the application and I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it until I had really as best a presentation as I could possibly put together. And, you know, you have to do your homework. Um, but but mainly you need to do it. So yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's really important. Thanks, next time.
Wow. Well, if, if there's no more questions, um, we'd like to thank Don for his time. And um, we're going to uh, put in the chat um, contact information. Um, if you have additional questions that you'd like to, to share privately, um, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, yeah, any other last questions before we head out? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm put my website, I hope that you'll list that, and also my email. So please don't feel shy about writing with a question or something you want to say to me. I'm happy to get your messages and happy to respond. So uh, it'd be my pleasure. And, and thanks to the Fulbright Association for the chance to share some of my work with you. Um, I, I'm happy to do it. it. It was fun, and I hope it was fun for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Thanks so much, Don. Don. Take care. Same to you. Buonasera. Buonasera. <laughs> A buongiorno. <laughs> A buongiorno. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.